Our guest speaker really needs little introduction. Many of you heard him speak at our annual dinner in 2013. Many of us listen to his commentaries on Michigan radio. Many of us read his column in the Record Eagle. He takes on the hard issues and he calls it as he sees it. A Detroit native, Jack Lessonberry, originally intended to become a historian, but then traveled the path to journalism during his graduate years at the University of Michigan. He has now accumulated nearly 40 years of journalism experience in every medium from newspapers to the internet. Jack has worked as a foreign correspondent and executive national editor of the Detroit News. He has written for many national and regional publications, including Vanity Fair, Esquire, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Boston Globe. Today's topic for Jack is a challenging one for all of us. It's entitled, Michigan in Crisis. How do we get here and how do we fix it? Let's give a warm Leelanau welcome to Jack Lessonberry. I accept the nomination. <laughs> I always wanted to say but that. Was, but I would like to thank you for that too kind introduction. It was really an honor to be invited to talk with you again this evening, and I really mean with you, not to you. I'm looking forward to as many questions and as much discussion as possible after I initially finished running my mouth. You know, as Marianne Mar Mar mentioned, I had the honor of speaking to many of you three years ago, soon after this chapter, the League of Women Voters of Leland All was founded, and uh, I see I didn't put you out of business. When I, when I was leaving last time, I asked my darling spouse if she thought you would ever invite me again, and she said, yeah, right. They'll ask you again when Donald Trump was a Republican nominee for president. <laughs> she didn't really say that. But I did see that, uh, I thought at first this was in Grand Traverse County, I was going to say that I could see that you had enough consideration for your neighbors that you moved uh, the meeting out of the main part of Leelanau County to spare them my presence. But I'm, I'm still honored to be here anyway. What you do is so important. When I was 12 years old, three college students were murdered for, the, for registering people, tortured and murdered for registering people to vote in Mississippi. And because of that, I don't think I've ever met, missed an election in my life maybe an uncontested school board race, but that would be about it. And what you do, just keep doing it. Now, I, can you hear me back there? No? Okay. Well, you're, up, you're complaining because you can hear me. I say, okay. Well, well here's the truth. I mean, and uh, our state is falling apart. Literally, and by almost every measure, things are getting worse in Michigan, despite the fact that the economy has rebounded from the depths of the Great Recession, as they call it, and unemployment has continued to drop. It's now under 5%. But ask most people if their lives are actually better, if they're able to more easily make ends meet and send their kids to school, and if they feel secure about their retirement, and you know the answers. Could we fix this? Certainly, if we had the political will to do it and a system in place to reflect the will of the people. But in fact, we don't. When it comes to Michigan, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are right about one thing, though maybe not in the way they think. The system is rigged, and it's rigged in a way that prevents any real solution to the problem. Michigan has fallen a long way from 40 years ago when we were in the top 10 states in terms of per capita income. We are 34th now. I checked with my favorite economist, Charles Ballard, at Michigan State yesterday. We're 34th, so that's up from 39th or 40th, but it still makes us right there in the poorest one-third of the states. And the distribution of that income is far more unequal than it has been at any time, not before just the Great Recession, but the Great Depression, or at least World War II. And that's not the worst of it. We're letting our infrastructure crumble before our eyes. Everybody here is aware of the issue with the pipeline under the Straits, Line 5 and Enbridge. They tell us not to worry, so I guess we shouldn't. But uh, um, that's the only pipeline I know that's old enough to collect Social Security on its own. <laughs> but beyond the pipeline, we haven't maintained our infrastructure. And the underpinnings of our civilization, the roads and bridges and water and sewer pipes, are crumbling far faster than we can replace them. In terms of roads, uh, 
on May 10th, the top expert in the highway department, MDOT, told me it would realistically get the roads, not perfect, but back to where they used to be, where they should be, $3 billion a year for the next 10 years. And what our lawmakers did in, in, instead was enact a lousy law last year that eventually will produce 1.2 million starting at about 2019. And that's only if they cut half of that money out of spe other spending, primarily spending on things like education and foster care. Uh, this is just nuts. Flint, we all know about Flint, the pipes in Flint. Flint is a canary in the coal mine. Every major industrial city in Michigan has aging pipes. In Detroit, some of the pipes, water pipes at least, are wooden. They go back to the Civil War. Um, there was a full-time squad of people in Detroit just to repair water main breaks. So, but we're not addressing that. Education. Everybody here knows that our only hope for the future is a better educated workforce. 70% of all new jobs in 2020, which is just around the corner, will require a significant education beyond high school. Not just conventional four-year college education, but, you know, post-high school education. Yet we're failing our students statewide. We're spending less on education. The governor and the legislature have been fighting over how to rescue the Detroit schools, public schools, from financial collapse. There's a general recognition that this has to be done, whether we want to or not, if only because the consequences of not doing so would cost us even more. The state constitution requires Michigan to provide an education for all children. Detroit schools are half a billion dollars in debt, more than that, and on the brink of not being able to pay their teachers or their staff. They've been fighting over uh, the amount of money for a bailout. The governor has what I think is a fairly sensible proposal of $715 million. They would divide the schools, sort of like the GM bankruptcy. There'd be an old school district which would be concerned with paying down the debt, a new one concerned with educating the kids. But the real problem, the governor wants to establish a Detroit Education Commission that would decide where any new public school, conventional or charter, or charters of public schools, they get our taxpayer dollars, where they could locate in order to prevent the kind of destructive competition that has left the area, the, some areas terribly underserved. Well, that's not going to happen. They're going to compromise and get rid of that. They, the State House wants no restraints over charter schools of any kind. A lot of their members get contributions from the charter school lobby. And the Speaker of the House has come right out and said, that's more important than saving Detroit schools. But beyond Detroit, we're a long way from Detroit here, is an even more significant story that Michigan Radio, where I work, reported last week, but too many news outlets basically ignored. The Education Trust Midwest, which is a nonpartisan research organization, released a new report showing that Michigan schools, all Michigan schools, are among the academically weakest in the nation and getting worse. And if you think this is a minority-based problem, think again. In fact, in terms of fourth grade reading skills, affluent, white, Michigan fourth graders are 50th in the nation. This will have devastating consequences for our economic future and where, as I said, you have to have education beyond high school. This may come as a surprise to some lawmakers, but I talked to a mother I know, a woman named Rebecca, a Michigan native in her 40s, who has two kids in a fairly affluent, in Farmington Hills, fairly affluent suburban district. She and her husband moved back here from San Diego in 2000, partly because their perception was the schools were good here. She told me she moved here for the schools, and now she's worried her kids won't even get into college. Her daughter has a 3.9 GPA, but she has poor scores on her ACTs and SATs. The teachers are teaching to the test. This year they taught to the wrong test. Uh, um, and Rebecca told me, she said, I know it didn't used to be like this. My mom was a teacher. I believed in Michigan's education system, and I'm not sure it could ever recover. Well, it could recover if we we're willing to make sort of long-term investments. The Education Trust Report, which I read, said what we try to do is a series of quick fixes. They don't work. We won't succeed with the one-off investments Michigan has long tried, the report said. It's going to take a series of interconnected changes in policy and practice fueled by strategic investments over multiple years. What does that mean? It means no more robbing the schools to give businesses a quick, politically popular tax cut. It mean a policy. Of, <laughs> it mean a policy of putting our children and our future first, which is what responsible government should do. You two people there are more important than me. 
Yeah, you. You know why? Because you're younger. I'm a baby boomer. I have a wonderful life, but I've had a chance to have a wonderful life. You deserve the same chance. And so do the rest of your children. I'm not sure that any issue could be more important. You know, see you know that funny bumper sticker that says, I'm spending my grandchildren's inheritance? Well, we are. And I think we're the first generation in history. The, the assumption was everybody wanted their kids to have a better life than they did. And so we're saying, screw them. And we have other problems at state. Let's talk about prisons. My mother was always worried I'd end up in prison. And the prisons in Michigan, 40 years ago, 1973, I guess that's 43 years ago, there were a total of 7,900 state prisoners. And they took, the, running the prisons cost 1.5% of the state general fund budget. Okay, our population today is less than, it's only about 10% higher than it was in 1973. Today, instead of 7,900 prisoners, we have 45,000. It costs 20% of the budget and getting worse every year. Part of this is because we had two great ideas. We would close all the mental hospitals in the state. And the other great idea is we'd lock up everybody who had a small amount of drugs. So I saw a satirical headline, I think it was in The Onion, that said, drug war ends, drugs win. <laughs> we could in the state easily. I, I, this is my th source for this is Milton Mack, the chief of probate judge in Wayne County, who's made a specialty of studying prisons for years and years. We could substantially reduce the number of prisoners by at least 10,000 and our taxpayer cost by at least 250 million without an increased threat to the citizens, but we don't because of our demagogic politicians, because they want it perceived as being tough on crime. Right now, in fact, in the, in the state legislature, there's a, guy, a, a Republican, Republicans control everything, Democrats are more or less irrelevant. The, the state senator John Proust, who's the Proust, who's the uh, chair of the relevant state senate subcommittee, wants to close two prisons and use the money from closing them saved to fix up these other older prisons that are crumbling. And they don't want to do that. Of course, uh, Bill Schuette is against anything to reduce the prison population. Those who run the Department of Corrections don't want to close any of our state's 35 prisons, and they say they need them in case the population ever goes up again. Now. It's actually not as bad as it was. Seven years ago, we had 51,000 prisoners. It's declined partly because violent crime has declined. We're an older population. Guys my age are less likely to knock off liquor stores and run down the alley. Um, I would need a moped to run down the alley. <laughs> and, because, and we have backed up some in this crazy drug policy, but 40,000 prisoners is way too many. It's a larger, larger prison population in our surrounding states, huge drain on our resources, costing us now much more than we spend on higher education. So instead of spending money on higher education, we're spending money on prisons. Guess what kind of population we're preparing for for the future? Um, if I want to be nasty, which I usually do, I could say that Michigan places a higher priority on locking people up than educating them, but I would never be the least bit sarcastic about government. Um, <laughs> but having said all this, Michigan doesn't need to save nickels and dimes and, report, and corrections reform. We need fundamental sweeping reform. Um, I was looking at statistics of the people in our prison. Now, cost on the average $35,000 a year to keep someone in prison. We have 11 people sentenced to long prison terms for smoking marijuana. We have uh, um, more than 400 prisoners who are over 75. Many of them were in wheelchairs or in walkers. One of these prisoners, their, their health bill, the state, uh, the bill for their health care last year was $316,000. Now, Connecticut got around this by starting a state-run nursing home, putting their prisoners in there, and having their cost assumed by Medicaid. There was a proposal to do that here, but Bill Schuette doesn't want to do that either. So, um, you know, this is sort of nuts. Detroit, I want to talk a little bit about Detroit. People, you know, one of, the, one of the big success stories, I think, uh, in recent years, and probably one of the two crowning successes of Governor Snyder's administration was the, the, the saving of Detroit with the emergency. We had, went under an emergency manager. This was a case where emergency management worked. They went through a bankruptcy. And Detroit, of course, is in much better shape. But to say Detroit has been saved, they're fixed, Detroit actually is like a seven-month uh, seven premature baby in the ICU. It survived birth, but its health is very precarious. It needs more jobs. It needs an edu education system that works. But uh, if you don't have these things, all it would take was a re another recession, a further cut in revenue sharing to send Detroit topping in the deficit again. Now, however, in a way, 
Detroit is better off than almost any other city in Michigan, including some northern Michigan cities, in that it at least knows the scope of its problems. If you think Traverse City uh, or Saginaw or any other city like that doesn't have a pension shortfall problem, that's because you're poorly informed or maybe delusional. It turned out that in Birmingham, Michigan, very affluent suburb of Detroit, they have a 50% shortfall in their pensions. And I could go on and on. This is because these things were all set up at a time when we, when we assumed the populations would just keep increasing, and they're not. You're not breeding enough. Um, but, the, you know, I could go on and on with examples like this, but the real question is, why haven't we fixed it? Why aren't we fixing it? And the, quite, the answer to that is that democracy, our democracy, is broken. That's not in any way hyperbole. Effective democratic representative government in this state has been destroyed by a combination of three toxic elements. First of all, term limits. We were all sold term limits in 1992 as a way to make sure there was a consistent supply of fresh blood and new ideas in government. That might have been nice in theory. It might even be happening to an extent if your average voter had the time and desire to carefully research the candidates and issues, but they don't. And so we're treated to things like the spectacle of former state senator Virgil Smith Jr. In from Detroit, who was elected because his father, former state senator Virgil Smith Sr., uh, was respected. The old elder Smith is now, a county, is now a circuit court judge. The younger Smith has never had a job other than being in the legislature. He was first elected at age 22. Um, his resume consisted of a whole lot of shoplifting convictions, drunken driving convictions, and however, he is now in prison after assaulting his ex-wife and shooting up her car. Uh, um, now, there's no way you can or should prevent family members from serving, from running, but because of term limits, people tend to elect people with familiar names without showing, without uh, knowing who they are. And that's probably the least of the problems. What it does is term limits supply us with an endless stream of lawmakers who never stay long enough to understand the process or build the relationships necessary to govern well. Now, we've transferred the power of the lobbyists and the special interest. In the old days, when I was young and I was thinner and my hair was dark and I wasn't quite so ugly as I am now, I would go up sometimes to Lansing and cover the legislature in the late 70s and early 80s. And what I noticed was there, was a, there were maybe 15 people in each party who'd been there 30 years. And they knew that was their life. They weren't going to be governor. They weren't going to be president. They weren't going to be senator. And at, at, some, at some level, they had a higher level to, of the, to the interest, a higher loyalty, pardon me, to the interest of the state of Michigan than to their parties. And after a certain amount of silliness, they would get, they'd say, all right, damn it, Joey, you get this and you got to, you get this, you got to live with that. Mary, you get this, you got to live with that. And they would get it done, and, they, and their lives depended on getting along with each other. You don't have that anymore. They're not there long enough. Uh, you know, there are only two kinds of people. A former a judge who was a legislator told me this. There's only two kinds of people who are not allowed to serve in the Michigan legislature. Those who are in prison and those who have proven they can do the job. <laughs> not only do term limits give us incompetence and nepotism, they breed corruption. Why? The average legislator, I would say, is in their 40s, maybe early 40s. So imagine they tell you, you can have this job for only six years. And you've got a wife and you've got kids. Are you going to be more loyal to the interest of the state or to the lobbyist who can give you a job afterwards? There was a guy named Paul Opsomer who should be in prison, but instead he was the, he was the chair of the State Transportation Committee, and he spent all of his time while he was chair of that committee blocking efforts to get a new bridge built across the Detroit River, badly needed new bridge. As soon as he left the legislature, he went to work for the Ambassador Bridge Company. Clear conflict of interest. In a lot of states, that's illegal, not in Michigan. And uh, you know, this is sort of, this has clearly been a policy disaster. Everybody I know of both parties quietly admits it is a disaster. We could try to repeal it, but no one's even been willing to try. Problem number two is the outrageous and rampant gerrymandering. The, the legislature is terribly gerrymandered to favor Republicans. Now, Democrats would have probably done the same thing if they had a chance, but they weren't in power either. This isn't a partisan statement. It is, un, unless things change, unless you have a constitutional amendment to change this, I have every confidence that I will not live long enough and you may not live long enough to ever see the Democrats have a majority in the state Senate. 
In 2014, almost the same number of votes were cast. 51%, uh, 50.5% of the votes were cast for Republican candidates for the state Senate. 49.5% were cast for Democrats. And that gave us 27 Republicans and 11 Democrats. It now, it's down to 10 now because Virgil's in jail. Um, more votes were cast for Democratic candidates for the State House of Representatives, but it elected a large Republican majority. Same thing on Congress. More votes were cast for Democratic candidates for Congress. We have nine Republicans and five Democrats. Now, the main problem with that is not the partisan mix. The main problem is that, of that is this, what this gerrymandering does is virtually all districts are one-party districts. So all the action is in a primary. Not a lot of people vote in August primaries. You know that as well or better than I do. And it tends to bring out people who are extreme. So you sort of get people on the extremes of both parties winding up in the legislature. And they know almost very, very few Republicans in the legislature fa can face a serious challenge from Democrats, vice versa. What they worry about is a challenge from their own party. And so they take extreme positions that commit them to not making the right decisions to make fix things in Michigan. Point of best example, the roads. All our road problems could have been solved very easily. Snyder sort of suggested something very much like this. His policy prescriptions on things other than Flint have generally been more rational than policies from either party in the legislature. If we had raised the gas tax by 20 cents a gallon, even 15 cents a gallon, we would have any problem anymore. And gas, it's going up again now, it's Memorial Day. Gas got down to like $1.70 a gallon. You know, five, six years ago, it was $4.50 a gallon. If, and the price of gas fluctuates all the time. After three days, nobody would notice a 20 cent increase. But they wouldn't do that because they've taken a vow not to raise taxes. And so our roads are falling apart. Roads are like tooth decay. You know, I have bad teeth, so I know. You get a little cavity, you go to the dentist, they fix it, you're fine. You ignore it, looking at a root canal and an abscess and all that pleasant stuff. And of course, and we have this, this hyper-partisanship where pe people, for a while, I'm a, I'm a member of the steering committee of the Center for Michigan, which is, non, which is a nonprofit, uh, bipartisan foundation that tries to instill common sense in state government. And we would have secret meetings so that Republicans and Democrats would talk to each other because they'd get in trouble if they would have dinner with each other. I mean, that's just such, and that's true in Washington, too. Um, uh, it just is crazy. A friend of mine who was a Republican congressman for a term went out to dinner. He was single. He went out to dinner with a Democratic woman congressman who was dinner, and the, leader, the leadership yelled at him, you're not supposed to socialize with these people. In the old days, you know, Tip O'Neill, the big, colorful Speaker of the House, a Democrat, he used to go have a drink after 5 o'clock with President Gerald Ford. And he'd say, Christ, Jerry, ain't this a great country? Here we can have a civilized drink like two friends. Tomorrow I'll be kicking your ass all over television. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> which, well, in a way, that's sort of charming, kind of healthy. So how do we fix it? Well, I suggest that the league knows the answer better than most people. One thing you have to do to, is vote. But, but last fall, the League of Women Voters of Michigan, I'm sure you know this, sponsored a series of town hall meetings across the state looking at ways to change the way Michigan draws its legislative and congressional districts. There might be 15 or 20 of those. And everybody who came to them agreed, agreed we needed change, but nobody was willing to try and pick up the ball and try to get a referendum on the ballot which to me is just bizarre. Now, I don't know whether your bylaws allow you to do that, but to me, it's the most expensive thing. The Democrats and the labor unions are forever, are forever spending millions and millions putting ballot proposals on the ballot that fail. Or they spend millions and millions running candidates who don't have a chance to win. This is what we need to do. In the state, we need to get to a point where we have an independent, nonpartisan, or at least bipartisan commission, which will redistrict the state every 10 years when the census comes out, using guidelines designed to keep contiguous and like-minded communities and people together. That would, also, that would create a lot more swing districts. It would also cut down dramatically on hyperpartisanship. Most people are pretty moderate. If you are in a swing district, the parties would tend to nominate sensible people who would appeal to a majority of the voters. We need to do that. We need a, term, a constitutional amendment ending term limits. We need both these things or the state will continue to go to hell. I started to say drift downwards, but the truth is we're turning into either Mississippi 
or a Haiti that has ice storms and where you can freeze to death. But special interests and lobbyists and much of the Republican Party does not want this. They will spend lavishly and they will lie and they will legislate and do everything they can to, to thwart such an effort and keep things from changing. But we have to try. One other thing, we have to make it easier for people to vote. There, have been, there has been a, a gleeful and open conspiracy to co prevent people from voting. This is one of the few states that has neither no reason absentee ballots or early voting. Even in Indiana, backwards Indiana, you can Ohio, you can go and vote. There's some days when they have the polls open before election day. We don't have that. And you know what? This, this election is going to be an unholy mess. You know why? Because they repealed straight ticket voting. Now, there's a lawsuit in federal court right now, which I pray uh, at least puts a stay on this law. But you imagine if you don't have straight ticket voting, it's going to mean that much more time people will spend in the booth if they're responsible. What it really means is more people will just ignore what we call the down ballot races. Some of you know Marilyn Kelly who uh, is, is one of my heroes. She was on the Michigan, she's from Leland she's on the Michigan Supreme Court. She's now a trustee at Wayne State University. She told me a marvelous story. When she was elected to the Supreme Court, she was, that was quite an honor. She was feeling pretty great. And the day after the election, she was, going to, she was going to work where she worked at the time. And she got in the elevator, and there was a man there who recognized her. And he said, my son voted for you. This guy was about 32. And she said, well, how old's your son? She, he said, four. And she looked at him and said, yeah, I said, I believe he needs to know about democracy. So I took him in the booth, and I voted for all the important races and let him vote for the rest. So, uh, <laughs> but these things are hard. One of my favorite quotations is one that I also used, I think, the last time I was here, when President Kennedy was asked in 1962 why on earth he was committing the United States to spend all this money and go to the moon, he said, we choose to go to this, the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. When it comes to Michigan, in the second decade of the 21st century, we need to do the things I've mentioned because otherwise, we're all going to be literally doomed as a state. There's any chance for stability and prosperity in the foreseeable future. Now, thank you for listening to me being so light and breezy. And now, I'd like to know what's on your minds and respond to your questions. So, thank you. Yes, sir. I respect your opinion on the product of business. I understand that. We like to spend the gales of November in beautiful downtown San Diego, California. So do I. We used to go there, and there was a slight homeless problem. California passed the law that says small drug issues. You don't have to be in prison anymore. Well, those people can't get a job. 20 years ago, you could take out the have you ever been in prison question off the application and look back. Right. Now everybody runs background checks. So the homeless population in downtown San Diego has gotten huge. And it bothered some good friends of ours who went out there a couple months ago. And it just bothered them. There's just too many people on the streets. What would we do? What would you suggest we do if we let these minor drug offenders out? How are we going to get them jobs? What are we going to do to prevent this problem? Well, that is another issue, isn't it? That, that we, we need to do something about these folks. But if you think the solution is warehousing them at $35,000 a year each in prison, I'm not sure that's a good answer either. Now, a lot of these folks uh, could be, in, a lot of the people in prison could be in prison because, uh, could be out if they were on medication, proper medication. You could monitor that. We could come up with programs. You know, this is a very complex problem. The, the great, Journalist H.L. Mencken once said that for every problem, there's a solution that's easy, simple, and wrong. So I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that keeping these people in prison forever probably isn't it. Homeless people, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for homelessness. I'm not an expert on it. But we need, we need to do something about it, but locking everybody else out. And, you know, there are still a lot of cities in Michigan that still have a lot of homeless people. And in other states, and your prisons don't, don't seem to be the answer to that. Um, yes, somebody. Somebody else. Yes, sir. Well, and, and being a business person, um, I think we should have some ways to involve business and rehabilitate these people. Of course. Give them some incentive to do it. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of ideas on this because we 
get a convicted felon, then they don't have much of a chance. No, so and then we let them out. Somebody takes them out. That's right. I mean, do we want to condemn people? That, the, the saying that I agree with in peniology circles is we need to lock up the people we're afraid of, not those we're mad at. And yes, there are people who are hopeless. There are people who are a dangerous society. Nobody's suggesting letting them out. But we, you know, if you want to stigmatize someone for life because of a mistake they made, especially with drugs at age 22, whatever, there's a guy named, the media calls him White Boy Rick, although it isn't fair to call him that. He's been in prison since he was 18 years old. He was a federal, they, the FBI recruited him as a drug informant when he was 14, and then they tossed him to the side of the co road. The only thing he knew how to do was sell drugs, so he sold drugs and he got put in prison. He's been there forever. Um, and that just, to me, is nuts. Uh, um, the shooting did not even, uh, and some of the state senate didn't even want to, the they, question came up about minors, people were sentenced when they were minors to life without the possibility of parole. They didn't even want to give those people a chance to have their cases reviewed until the Supreme Court said you had to do that. So sure, we need sort of a holistic approach. One other thing that I think is nuts, bad, and should be unconstitutional is a federal sex offender list where you commit any kind of a crime that's a, uh, sort of a sex crime. Um, uh, you get to put on this list, your house gets put on the list, and you're sort of stigmatized forever. I know a young man, it's a great tragedy, who was, who was, he was kind of a troubled kid, and he was looking at child porn. On the, he, no one ever alleged he touched anybody, but somebody asked him, you want to sell some of that to me? And it was the FBI. And he's in federal prison. He's 23 years old. His parents' home is on the federal sex offender list. Now, when that kid gets out, what chance is he ever going to have to have a job and rehabil be rehabilitated? None. So we're condemning all these people to these lives. It doesn't have, it's not socially useful. And it's costing us a lot of money. Let me say one thing I forgot to say, too. And we should all be ashamed of ourselves. There was a, young, a woman who I admired named Jackie, I can't remember her last name, from Pelston. And she led a group of citizens who were trying to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot to have us vote by mail. The only sensible solution to voting in this country, especially the way we have elections now, is voting by mail. In Oregon, in Washington, in all or most of Colorado, in parts of California, that's how they vote. And you know what happens? They don't have 45% turnout, they have 79% turnout. They have people it saves the state millions of dollars. You don't have polling places. You, the state mails everybody a ballot, and you mail it back in. I do not, for the life of me, know how anybody can go into a voting booth, especially in a presidential election, and make intelligent decisions. If everybody went in that booth and read just all the proposals and tried to make sense of them, they'd still be voting in February. So what do people do? I mean, I do this for a living. I analyze elections for a living. I have for 40 years. And I get, but I have the great advantage of being old. Because I'm over 60, I get an automatic absentee ballot. And I'm looking at my la the last time I looked, and I know most of these people, but there are people running for the Board of Trustees of my local community college. I have no idea who they are. So I could do, what most voters do is A, they, vote, they skip it. B, they vote for Irish names. <laughs> Except in Macomb County where they vote for Italian names. And what I did is I called a woman friend of mine who used to be on the board. And I said, Jeannie, who should I vote for? And she told me. But you can't make sense of this in a voting booth. And it disenfranchises people. If you are a working single parent, and you've got to work a job from 9 to 5 or 9 to 6, and you get an hour for lunch, and you've got to get the kids at the end of the day, when are you going to have a chance to vote? And we don't allow those folks to have absentee ballots unless they lie. In Michigan, you can only get an absentee ballot if you're old, if you know you're going to be out of the state, if you're in the hospital, or if you're in jail and haven't been convicted yet. Uh, so this is just, this is nuts. You know, I think the League of Women Voters ought to put a lot of its muscle behind making it easier for people to vote. Now, you know, we, we, we sometimes chastise people for not showing up to vote who could vote, and that's, that's a very fair and reasonable thing, but the fact is we make it very hard. Yes, ma'am. What are the statistics on states that have early voting? They do better than we do. 
They do better than we do. But the, the states that do the best of all are states that mail ballots out to people, and they send them back. And, you know, we know the consequences of people not voting. It, it, you know, the more people, um, Republicans tend not to like it, frankly, because the perception is the more people vote, the better it is for Democrats. I'm not addressing this from a partisan concern. I'm addressing it from a uh, just concern. We want people to weigh in on things. Now, if you don't, if you, there's a particular race and you don't have an opinion, you don't care, it might be better not to vote than, than to cast a wrong-headed vote but if you had a ballot at home, you could study it and make an informed decision. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you speak a little bit about the current money and what we might be able to do to try and get the ballot to the process? There's no end of problems. Dark money is a great book called Dark Money, I think, by Jane Jacobs. Uh, dark money is, it refers to money that is uh, contributions to candidates that you have no ability to find out where this money comes from. A lot of people were horrified by the Supreme Court decision in a case called Citizens United in January 2010 that basically said corporations can give all the, that money is, money is free speech, corporations are people, and they can spend all the money they want to try to influence election. But that same Supreme Court said that we have the right to require disclosure of where that money comes from. Michigan passed a law saying, uh-uh, they can have dark money. I could form a group, and I could call it Citizens for Puppies and Kittens. And I could get contributions from the Ku Klux Klan, the American Communist Party, and the National League of Child Molesters. And I could use that to run so-called issue-oriented ads. And nobody would have any right to know or ability to find out where that money came from other than it was paid for by the Committee for Puppies and Kittens. And stuff like that goes on. It goes on. Now, you can't use that money to attack, to run an ad saying, vote for candidate Jones. But you could run an ad that says, candidate Jones is running against candidate Smith. Candidate Smith loves terrorists. He's a scum-sucking parasite. And uh, he beats his grandmother with a metal rod. You can do that. And the equivalent, um, a, uh, a woman I know, uh, Bridget McCormick, is one of the smartest Michigan Supreme Court justices, and she was a dean of the law school at the, at the University of Michigan. Her husband, for when I first knew him, had, was a lawyer with only one client. His client was named Barack Obama, and he's now the attorney for the Department of Energy. These are high-flying people. And when she ran for the Supreme Court, because she was a lawyer, because she was a law professor, she volunteered that, if necessary, she volunteered to defend one of the defendants at Guantanamo. It's sort of your, your duty to do that. Because of that, they spent a million dollars running running ads saying that she loved terrorists. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Yes, ma'am. You know, the, the league, um, league actually held 50 or so right. conferences or, or forums on the throughout Michigan. And I think you know, there were three held here. And I think our league was somewhat disappointed that the league didn't go forward. But at a recent meeting in Lansing, they're talking about going forward in 2017. One of the challenges was that the, the labor unions, you know, the people with the big bucks to run a campaign with money for ads and right. all that weren't behind it. That's right. So speak a little bit about if those folks aren't going to get behind it, the, the option of just a grassroots led the wiggle knee going forward on the, the voting by mail and the redistricting. I mean, it's challenging, but do you see that as a pathway to still run that constitutional amendment campaign? I think you got to do it, and you you know if you can't if you can't get the big money boys, then you do it yourself, and then you find a way of doing it, stirring up support. My my own personal opinion is that Michigan needs a new constitutional convention. We don't get a chance to have one again in the 2026. We only every 16 years we're asked if we want to have one or not. But in lieu of that, yeah, you just can't wait for the big money to people to come around. Now look, you, you know the history is full of people who made progress by doing stuff when every Everybody else told them they couldn't have done it. Imagine if 13 years ago, 12 years ago, I came here and I said, the next president of the United States will be a black guy with an African name whose father's a Kenyan Muslim. <laughs> I always say that if I, if what I should have done in 2004, I was always stupid, I didn't know what was going on, I should have driven, I should have sold my house. There was a time you could still sell houses then, and I would have driven to Las Vegas and said, I would have bet all this on that. <laughs> if I had done that, Bill Gates and uh, 
everybody else would have a special name for me today. They would call me boss. <laughs> so you just do it. Look, for, even for example, this year, Bernie Sanders is not in all probability going to be the Democratic nominee for president. But here's a guy who started out, senator from Vermont. Nobody knew who he was. Um, I called him a few years ago to ask his, his opinion on an issue. He has answered his own phone. Uh, and he starts out running for president saying, hi, I'm a Democratic Socialist. Being a socialist in this, in this president environment is somewhat worse than being a child molester. I'm a Democratic Socialist from one of the smallest states in the union ever, and I'm going to run for president. He has gotten 10 million votes. He's won primaries or caucuses in 21 states. States. He'll win more before he's done. He didn't, and he raised more money on the internet than any candidate in history. Now, we have this thing called the internet. It's not just for pornography anymore. You can use it for other things, like raising money. So you tell people, let's take back our government. Let's take back our government so that you have a chance to actually be represented, so you have a chance actually to vote. And if you're not going to do it, who is? If you're a League of Women Voters, League of Voters, you're the people who should The League of Women Voters also is generally very highly regarded, with the exception of a few bomb throwers. There's a recognition that it's a nonpartisan institution. Recruit some people from both parties to do something about it. It will be hard. It will cost a lot of money. But anything worth doing is generally been hard. Yes, ma'am. Um, I talk about the charter schools. Right. And, um, I'll repeat your question. Okay. Uh, I'll Go ahead, please. And, as you know, in the Detroit Free Press two years ago, right. they, almost two years ago, they did a eight-part series exposing right. charter schools. Charter schools, right? And uh, Michigan has the largest number of for-profit charter schools in right. the nation, twice the next highest number. Right. With the authorizers taking 3% off of the top, right. which would equate to locally, for example, the Grand Traffic Academy paying LSSU $277,000 a year to authorize the school. So my question to you is, how does for-profit fit in an education model at this particular school uh, two years ago, $1.6 million of missing money was written off to bad debt by a current school board president, who sits as a school board president today, who sat in the trial of the founder of the school in December and had to testify under oath, I was there, I heard it, that he was soliciting a business deal on behalf of my good friend and colleague, Stephen Ingersoll, post-indictment, post-conviction. Post-conviction, the school board president was in the business deal on the guy who took money from this school, along with the um, LSSU's retired director of charter schools, Bruce Carter. These guys are all in the steal. I wrote to Attorney General Schutte. I said, help. What can I do? And he said, yeah, no problem. Go to the authorizer. Or go to law enforcement president. Or the Attorney General Schutte. I like that. If the mafia is bothering you, go to Al Capone. Yes, I like. Yes, for sure. The authorizer was in on it. That's before I sat in the courtroom and listened to that the authorizer was part of this. So please have at this. I'm so frustrated. Um, charter schools are a living proof of that there is a devil. And I am the most. And the charter school lobby hates me more than anyone else. Charter schools are horrible. They are horrible. There are some good ones, but they have ruined education in the state. This stems back to Proposal A. Remember Proposal A in the March of 1994? Kalkaska was always a poster child for why we need it. They don't run out of money back every year and have to close about February because the schools at the time were funded by local millages. And Proposal A switched it to a state system where they, by a per pupil grant, would be the primary funding source. I was working for the New York Times at that time, and the next day I went to see the principal of the high school in Bloomfield Hills, most affluent place in Detroit. I said, what do you think? He said, I'm taking early retirement at the end of this year. He said, this will be very good. It will destroy the ability of schools like mine to compete with private schools, and it will be very good for the Calcaskas of the state for 10 years, and then everything will be destroyed. So the idea, you know, the idea of a for-profit school is repugnant. People, the lobbyists, in certain spe love this because we spend 13 or 14 billion dollars a year in education. They want to get their hands on that money. It should be absolutely illegal for for-profit private 
charter schools to exist. And I don't like, I would never have allowed charter schools in the first place. I recognize that some public school systems are very deficient. Detroit, certainly, some other older cities. But what we need to do is figure out a way to make public education work. Charters are public schools, yes, but we have had virtually no restraints on who can operate as charter. You've got some very bad charter schools. Some of them go out of business in the middle of the year. Now, most of us, if I, as I was telling somebody at, at dinner, I did my part for the human gene pool by not reproducing, but if I had a child, I mean, I have a certain level of education, I probably could figure out what the best school was. But if I'm a single parent with a high school education working 12 or 13 hours a day, how am I gonna know? How am I going to know where to put my child? And this is, and every child that goes to a charter school drains $7,800, $7,900 a year in revenue from the conventional public schools. So we need to fix public education. If you don't want to have your child go to public schools, there's nothing wrong with private schools. I'm all in favor of private schools because they're not supported by taxpayer dollars. You want to have a private school, fine, but you need to fix public schools. But. Uh, the Attorney General is a vest. He is running for president, or he, he wants to run for president. He's running for governor. He wants the support of the right wing of the Republican Party and people like the charter school lobby. And so he's not going to do anything against them. And so the, part, the point is, even if you disagree with me, the point is not charter schools or public schools or uh, schools with pink taffeta. The point is to have schools that educate our children. And America was always, it, this was idealistic, but it pretty much worked that you had public schools where the banker's kid and the doctor's kid went to work with the laborer's kid, and you had a sort of a social leveling. But we don't have that anymore, and that's, I think, a bad thing. We have a, a kind of what concerns me about this country and distresses me is that we, have be, we are evolving into groups of people who talk to nobody except people like themselves. We have right-wing radio and we have left-wing radio. We have right-wing media and left-wing media. The day after George W. Bush was re-elected in 2004, I went to a dinner party at the home of a rich, affluent, liberal doctor. Right? Rich and affluent are synonyms. And this little woman said to me, very bewildered, she said, I've never met anyone who voted for George W. Bush. How could he have won? I said, well, of course you did. They just haven't told you. But that's, you know, and there are people, um, there are people who couldn't believe that Obama was, was reelected. I heard, from, you know, after all, he was a Muslim socialist communist who wanted to destroy America, and all these people voted for him. So, I mean, there's something wrong. So, yes, I think we need to fix public schools. There's been a lot of blame to go around, but the, we should be fixing the problem, not the blame. I think the hook's coming out, but I'd like to take, I'd like to take one, two more questions. Two more questions. Yes, ma'am. I would like your insight into our legislature and maybe all legislatures. When you train as a teacher, you're taught to be proactive, anticipate what can go wrong in your classroom and prepare for it. And it seems like over and over again, whether it's the pipeline, Flint, Detroit, Detroit Public Schools, there's no recognition that something could go wrong here. Let's deal with it before before it occurs. Do you want me to tell you why they don't do that? Why? I'll tell you why. Do you have a house? Yes. Do you own a house? Yes. Let's say that someone came to you and said, you have a serious problem with the pipes under your house. And 10 years from now, they're going to burst. However, you could only have this house for six years. You have to worry about anything for the next six years. Would you spend $20,000 to fix them? Of course not, unless you're responsible and one of the one half or one percent of people who care. They, if you can sweep the problems under the rug for 10 years and you can't be there any more than six or eight years, you're going to do it. It's human nature. That's what happened. That's why they're that way. There's another thing. The first mayor daily of Chicago, you know, the guy who was famous, he was, you know, sort of spoken kind of, a, you know, a malaprop English. He said once, he said, you don't get no political credit for fixing anything below ground. You build a skyscraper, you get headlines. You fix the toilets, forget it. So they don't. And we're paying the consequences of that. One more question. I talk about toilets a lot. I'm sorry. Well, one more question. Because I drink too much coffee. Yes, sir. The uh, financial manager situation really offends me because it takes democracy away from the people. A dictatorship right. comes in, and nobody talks about that. They talk about all the other stuff, but they don't talk about taking the voice of the people out of their hands and screwing them. Well, they are now because of Flint. 
Um, the, we, I think what we have to do is sort of look at the, sort of the, the bigger picture. And you, you're exactly right. In fact, one of the biggest insults to the voters was in 2012, the people of Michigan voted to get rid of the emergency manager law. And the legislature not only reinstated it, they have a, no, a new underhanded thing they do to stick a phony appropriation in it so people can't you know, repeal it anymore. They did that with straight ticket voting. Twice they've done that before, and the people repealed it, so they put in a phony appropriation. But there's a, the emergency manager, we've had several versions of that. The, it's not just Snyder. The first Emergency Manager Act was passed in 1984 under Governor Blanchard, and that worked pretty well. It bailed out some places like Hamtramck and Highland Park. Then there was this, the Snyder one, and it was strengthened in 1990. Snyder put in a much more draconian one. And the problem is, in Detroit, it worked. It worked for a combination of circumstances, one of which was that there was a, under a whole lot of public scrutiny. Everybody was watching Detroit. They were very fortunate in the emergency manager, but everybody had a vested interest in fixing Detroit. In Flint, nobody cared about poor Flint. Nobody paid any attention to poor Flint. And the main problem with the Emergency Manager Act is it puts all the premium on balancing the budget, not taking care of people, not building for the future. So if, it's, if it saves money, to give people poison water, they did that. And Snyder, they, the, set, the tragedy is, Snyder was, was the guy, again, who fixed Detroit, who um, is the main reason we're going to have a badly new, needed new bridge across the Detroit River. We would not had it under any other governor. He will be remembered as the man who poisoned Flint. And the biggest baffling mystery and crime that is shared in by the media of the state is Flint switched to the Flint River water in April of 2014. In October of 2014, General Motors announced that its engine plant in Flint would not use that water anymore, would pay extra for other water because the water was corroding its engine parts. But nobody thought, well, maybe it's bad for people to drink water that's destroying <laughs> engine parts. No, no. So that, obviously, I think it's easy to say all or nothing solutions. We need some version where you can have emergency management with better oversight in some situations, but not what we have now. But I tell you that Detroit had to have an emergency manager. It was the only way you could get Detroit back where it was. But that was an extreme, an extreme situation. I want to thank you all for giving up a beautiful night to listen to me.